Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daisy DeLogo. I'm the faculty director of the Center for the Study for Gender and Sexuality. And I'm going to be introducing the person who is going to be introducing tonight's speaker. Yes, I am. And giving that person an award. So this is really special. The Outstanding Speaker Series is an annual distinguished lecture series that brings to the University of Chicago scholars, professionals, activists, and public figures who've made significant contributions to and on behalf of the LGBTQ plus community. We hope this series will expand the public discourse around gender and sexuality at the university and beyond, and that the people and work we feature will serve as an inspiration to students, providing new opportunities and frameworks for future scholarship and public engagement. This series was established and endowed by U Chicago Alumni Pride in collaboration with the center. I want to thank the board and membership of U Chicago Alumni Pride for their commitment to establishing and endowing this series. As part of the Outstanding Speaker Series, a University of Chicago student is selected each year to receive the LGBTQ plus Community Engagement Award to honor exceptional contributions that advance and support the interests of the LGBTQ plus community. It's my pleasure, therefore, to introduce you to the inaugural 2023 UChicago LGBTQ plus Community Engagement Award recipient, Sam Usman. Uh, and there she is. <laughs> Kind of stand you can stand awkwardly. Uh, Sam's a doctoral candidate in astronomy and astrophysics. As an LGBTQ plus scientist, Sam has shown herself to be a dedicated advocate and leader, first in her master's program at Cardiff University, where she organized a speaker event in celebration of the first international LGBT plus in STEM day, and at UChicago, where she has served as a role model for other queer students and as a mentor to undergraduate and graduate women through the Women and Gender Minorities in Physics group and the PSD's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Mentorship Programs. Sam has further demonstrated her deep commitment to fostering community among LGBTQ plus students beyond her own academic orbit. In the autumn of 2020, the very dark days of COVID, Sam founded the UChicago Plus Discord server creating a much needed peer led forum for queer students across the university to connect with and support one another. UChicago Plus has since held frequent in, uh, in person social events, thank God, discussions and meetups. In addition, it serves as a sounding board and point of connection for questioning students who can interact anonymously if they choose. UChicago Plus is now a flourishing RSO and a Q group under LGBTQ student life. The LGBTQ plus Community Engagement Awards Selection Committee, comprised of UChicago alumni and staff members, was deeply impressed by Sam's work within STEM, her efforts beyond the physical sciences, and her commitment to community building, both on and off campus. Sam has demonstrated exceptional leadership and made numerous contributions to advance and support the interests of the LGBTQ plus community at UChicago within her academic and professional field and beyond. So please join me again in recognizing Sam Usman, who will introduce this evening's outstanding speaker. There you go. You get a whole folder. <laughs> do I stand at the lectern or do I stand? Does it matter? Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I had a hard time figuring out what I was going to be talking about today. Uh, as an astro PhD candidate, it would be a lot easier for me to talk about star clusters in the Milky Way, but that's not what we're here for. Um, so I spoke with Jean Olson last week about what to talk about, um, and she suggested that I talk about my activism, and, and that word really struck me, activism. I guess what I've done in the past few years never really felt like activism to me. I think because I've always just been focused on looking for a community, looking for shared culture, shared history with the LGBT community. So the idea of activism felt a little off. It made me think of this couple that I met over the summer with um, my girlfriend and I, we went out to brunch and uh, the table next to us had an older lesbian couple and they wondered why aren't more people into activism and they were thinking like i was thinking activism is marching in the streets um protesting against changes 
and other things that are happening in this country, transphobic and homophobic rules that are being put in place and the society that seems to push against us. And that is not what I do. What I do is a lot quieter, a lot more focused on community. The same couple, even though they were asking why aren't more people into activism these days, they also at the same time never referred to themselves as gay or queer or lesbian. They would say people like us. <laughs> um, and they would, even though they were together for more than 30 years and they were they worked together, they weren't out to anybody around them. Their boss may be new, but no co-workers and definitely none of their clients. And so even though what I've been doing is not protesting in the street, it's not sit-ins, it's nothing like that, I am just hoping to create a community where anyone can figure out who they are with the people around them and not feel like they're broken or lost. And that last bit probably is more a reflection of me than of anything else. Because I know some people figure out who they are when they're 12, um, but I came into college having absolutely no idea what my sexuality was. <laughs> I wanted to be you know, someone who fit in and I was not that person. It took forever for me to figure out who I was. It took me until junior, senior year of college to even come into the closet, to let myself know who I was. And I wasn't out, I wasn't loud, I wasn't proud about who I was. I was the people like us type of person. I was <laughs> quiet about it. And it wasn't until I started getting into my master's program where I started being more involved in the LGBT community. And like mentioned, the first thing I did, the first out activism, I suppose that I did, was to organize the first, an event for the first LGBT in STEM day. We brought in faculty who were out and proud in the 1980s, which in the UK was actually illegal to be very, um, to promote homosexual activities, um, to be out and proud and about who you are in the UK. And this type of connection, this community building, I tried to continue as I moved into my PhD program. And this kind of first started with the out in PSD event that the physical sciences division hosted during my first or second year, um, in which they talked about, um, they celebrated queer scientists and other allies in the physical sciences division. And this continued more with the mentorship programs mentioned, including women in physics program, the diversity peer mentorship program. Uh, there's a couple of other um, mentorship programs run through the PSD that I got involved with. And so through this whole thing, I'm trying to just focus on connecting with other LGBT people. And yet this whole time, I'm still feeling relatively disconnected myself from this LGBT community. It's like, I've been saying that I have been was bisexual for five years at that point, and I still felt a little bit off, a little bit broken, a little bit lost. And this really came to a head during the pandemic. Everyone, of course, was online. Nobody was meeting in person, so I got involved in a Discord platform, not the one that I made, but a different one, it was made up of people all across the US and abroad. And through this messaging platform, I was able to talk about my experiences, talking about how I felt a little bit broken, a little bit lost, a little bit disconnected from everything that I was supposed to feel. I was in a relationship with someone I cared a lot about who I found attractive, but I wasn't feeling what I was supposed to. I felt like there was something off with me, not with them, but I felt a little bit broken and disconnected. And it wasn't until someone in this Discord, um, Discord server messaged me and said, maybe you're demisexual, maybe you're asexual. And then once I learned about like what these terms mean, it was only then that a new world was open to me. I'm not broken. I'm not lost, I'm just asexual. <laughs> and it took me until I was 27 to figure this out. I'm not this 12 year old who's figuring this out when I'm just a young child. And so it took finding this online community, finding other LGBT people to find where I would fit in. And so I thought this would be something that could be really great for other students. 
especially students like me who went into college having no idea that they didn't fit this cis heteronormative box that society tries to shove us in as soon as we're born. And so I created a Discord server for U Chicago students. It's U Chicago Plus. We now have we now have more than 400 people in the server. We are a Q group under Center for Identity Inclusion. We're a registered student organization, a recognized student club by the university. And I hope that none of these students ever go into through their lives thinking that they're lost or broken, maybe a little bit of a robot or a little bit of an alien, not quite fitting that mold that they're supposed to. And so I'm hoping that everyone at UChicago and beyond in the LGBT community has someone to turn to, someone to learn about themselves and about our shared community and shared culture, this shared history. And for shared history, it's really important to look back on where we came from. And for this, it's really great to turn to experts like our speaker today. That's Professor Jules Gilkerson. She's an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University, and she's an expert in transgender history. She holds a fellowship at Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard, and she's really well known for her 2018 book called The Transgender T Child, which won the Lambda Literary Award for Transgender Literature, Children's Literature Association Book Award, and is really the first book that shatters the myth that trans transgender children are a new phenomenon for the 21st century alone. And whoop, she's written for the New York Times, CNN, The Lily, Jewish Currents, The New Inquiry, and many more. She also has a popular substack called Sad Brown Girl, is a co-editor of Transgender Studies Quarterly, and she's got two more books in the work a sh in the works, A Short History of Trans Misogyny, which is out in January, and Gender Underground, A History of Trans DIY. So I would like to welcome Professor Jules Gail Peterson. Well, thank you so, so much, Sam. And congratulations. Can we give one more round of applause to Sam, too? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, oh, yeah, this meeting is being recorded. Thanks, Zoom. Um, it's such an honor to be here. You know, I have been kind of, you know, through friends and, and interlocutors and loved ones have been lucky enough to, despite never having been a U Chicago student, to kind of have been hanging out at CSGS for almost probably 10 years now. And I have to say, it's been like a couple of years since I've been here. And, and just what you're saying, Sam, kind of resonated with me, because I'll just say many different iterations of Jules has, have been in this room <laughs> with many different sexualities and genders. This one, like I'm pretty happy with, probably gonna stick around, but I'm, you know, grateful to be back here. And I mean, it's not like often that I get to give a lecture to a standing room only kind of crowd. So let me do my best to make it worth it, uh, you know, and try and get into some nitty gritty tonight, uh, but also keep it keep it interesting and relevant. Um, yeah, so this is, and, and, and I'll start that by saying the title of this lecture is the kind of joke that maybe one or two historians would find funny. So <laughs> if by the end of the talk, it sort of clicks for you, you don't have to laugh, but you know, I'll, I'll know I'll, I'll know that I've done part of my job. So this is great society transsexualism on the political economy of transition. You know, among the many, many, many criticisms that we might levy at the culture war framing of trans issues today, I think one that would actually reveal a noteworthy consensus across the proverbial political spectrum is the way it dematerializes trans people's lives. Right-wing actors who are targeting public restrooms, education, healthcare, uh, the legal administrative state, and more often tout trans people as sort of decadent cultural impositions on working people whose common sense values are apparently stored in slogans as elegant as there are only two genders. So I'm conjuring someone here, maybe a little bit more like Ohio Senator J.D. Vance than say Georgia Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. But critics of the right tend to share in much of this particular premise. One partisan defense of trans people from within the Democratic Party indicts anti-trans politics as one of many cheap distractions from the economic issues that motivate real voters. 
to turn out, you know, the median suburban mother, one of the party's favorites, or white men without a college degree whose common sense the party would reclaim as temperamentally tolerant, but in need of protection from being overwhelmed by trans demands. Here I'm conjuring someone more like uh, Matt Iglesias or the Pod Save America podcast crowd. Now, further on the left, there is, of course, a broader history of crass and dogmatic materialism that treats trans people's wants with suspicion, positioning them as ideological devices that train movements away from the real capitalist crises of stagnant wages, inflation, and record global wealth inequality, as if those have nothing to do with trans people. This delinking of trans people's lives, particularly the practice of transition from its material conditions, just couldn't be less effective as a pro-trans politics. Sorry to show this graphic, but uh, if it'll let me. All right, I'll just do it that way. You know, as we're talking tonight, 21 U.S. states have passed laws that ban or criminalize delivering gender-affirming care to minors. Several states are considering, have already tried, and in the case of Florida, have succeeded in removing some of that health care from adults as well. You know, a single nonprofit organization that provides housing to trans people in my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland, has received over 7,000 phone calls from people seeking a new home in a state with legal protections for transition. But obviously, picking up and moving is not a genuine remedy, even for people who manage to do it. There's already disagreement in federal courts over the constitutionality of these kinds of laws. And in fact, just yesterday, the ACLU filed a petition asking for a hearing on overturning a lower court decision that upheld those laws in Tennessee and Kentucky. But given that the legal premise of a right to privacy which is what sits underneath the legality of medical transition is the exact same one this conservative Supreme Court riffed up in overturning Roe versus Wade, and that a number of Republican politicians are already campaigning on passing a national health care ban if they retake the Congress. Seems to me the criminalization of transition is fast becoming the norm, not the exception. Yet the dominant defense of trans people and the right to transition continues to shrink the real conditions of their existence into privatized matters of psychology, suicidality risk, and medical gatekeeping. Similar to abortion, that slogan, it's just healthcare, concedes that transition is best a matter of technical management, not of broad material concern, and certainly not of concern to non-trans people struggling to pay rent, pay for groceries, or pay for gas. As you can tell in my tone of voice, this state of affairs has grown utterly intolerable to me. But I'll add, as a professor, it's also intellectually a dead end. It shows no curiosity about the manifest differences in conditions through which transition becomes a possibility. So my current book project is borrowing the trans vernacular DIY, or do-it-yourself, to historicize transition. You know, you might sort of encounter whispers today about DIY as the alternative form transition has to take in places where it's been criminalized, especially through the uh, possibility of self-administering hormones without a prescription. But actually DIY emerged, at least in the mid 20th century, precisely because the moment, that was the moment where the institutional capture and sequester of transition by medical gatekeepers first created the concept of some sort of alternative or antithesis. So I'd say that prior to the 1930s and 1940s, basically all transitions were conceptually do-it-yourself in the sense that they were structured not by medicine, but by the immediate functions of gender in organizing the division of labor, right? The distinction between public and private spheres, legal rights, private property ownership, and family formation. The introduction of medicalization not only kind of created the idea of DIY as its opposite or its foil, it also, as I wanna to share tonight, restructured the class relationships and racialized hierarchies that unevenly organize trans people's lives to this day. 
So to make sense of all of these shifts, I'm really trying to approach transition in my current work, not as a medical or even a primarily cultural practice, and not just as a movement away from assigned gender, but actually through its political economic history, which I promise is less boring than it might sound. Mm -hmm. Broadly, I'm arguing that during the 50 year period from the 1940s to the 1990s, medical transition acquired a dominant political economic function. And that function was welfare reform. And I mean that in two senses, and then I'm gonna spend 30 minutes explaining what I mean. But first, I wanna suggest it was engineered medical transition to coerce out of changing gender, self-reliant workers appropriately gendered for the labor markets hegemonic social forms, including the nuclear family, which is designed to help facilitate how the labor market works. And second, medical transition generate a whole mid-century social service landscape that kind of presages or previews the wider function that the healthcare sector would go on to acquire in the US of absorbing the ravages of inequality inflamed by deindustrialization, privatization, and the ascent of neoliberal projects like austerity. So medical transition became a surrogate, a pitiful stand-in for housing, for jobs, relief from criminalization, and honestly, for the money that it would take to address the precarity attending poor trans people's lives. As the historian Gabriel Winant has shown, you know, by the 1980s, healthcare in this country has was made to absorb all of the shocks to the working classes and the crisis in its reproduction that were caused by the industrial declines and mass um, unemployment and recessions of the prior decade and a half. But interestingly, for trans women on the street who are sort of the primary social unit of DIY transition, that historical decline in standards of living and its capture by medicine began a lot earlier. Arguably, I'd say during the wartime economic boom, whose subsequent implosion drove the growth of healthcare and service, uh, social service work you know, more broadly in the economy. So poor trans people, but disproportionately women, constituted one element in a pool of surplus labor whose exclusion from the formal economy both created this gender underground, that's kind of the title of my book, and turn DIY transition into sort of the enemy or the foil of respectable medical transition. But I actually think what's interesting about that is that it hastened or at least signaled the advent of neoliberal social and economic logics more broadly in US society, sort of a canary in the coal mine kind of thesis. In other words, the sort of characteristic downward mobility and criminalization that especially trans women would acquire through transition in any economy that was structured by a gender division of labor was transformed over 50 years into the kind of structuring poverty and survival form of poor trans people's existence to this day. And that's partially why black and brown trans women, migrants, the incarcerated and sex workers most intensely have come to constitute an underclass to US society in general, but also I wanna stress an underclass to the so-called LGBT and trans communities. These are the primary people for whom DIY was and remains the primary or only way of transition or the preferred way actually. So by approaching, by approaching transition through the lens of political economy, I'm sort of broadly you know, trying to break with the dominant methodology in trans studies, which I think has sort of inflated that term trans with a kind of ontological significance and has deployed it as a lens through which anything and everything can kind of be studied to figure out how trans it really is, right? Often with a kind of real romance <laughs> for the negative, idealizing transness as sort of the virtuous property of inspiring outlaws. Well, I kind of just want to flip that whole idea on its head. So rather than using trans as a lens through which to look for the hidden, the repressed, or the buried trans subjects or themes in the past, I kind of want to do the opposite. Ask how the most conventional, the most well-known parts of US history 
were actually a little bit trans in some empirical sense, often though hiding in plain sight. So just to say, I don't see trans history, even the history of the poorest racialized trans people's DIY transitions as peripheral to dominant processes in US history. On the contrary, I see the class and race antagonisms of which they were a part as integral to a much larger sort of gendered history of political economy and also statecraft. So that's a, a broad way of putting it. But what I wanna share with you tonight is a really interesting and small corner of this work that focuses on San Francisco's central city neighborhood in the second half of the 1960s. And I'm not turning here as a case study. I actually think it has causal significance historically. And you might've heard of this neighborhood. It's sort of the single most famous and well-studied place in all of US trans history, partly because it was the site in 1966 of the Compton's Cafeteria riot, a pre-Stonewall emblem of resistance in which drag queens, trans women, and gay hustlers battled the police at the corner of Turk and Taylor streets. And actually the streets around Compton's became home starting in the 1960s to a poor trans feminine street culture organized around sex work on the stroll, a culture that had to endure not just through the AIDS crisis, but also successive waves of gentrification to the point now where very little of this social world is left. There are a lot of tech buildings in the area, but it's also been declared a historic district. Um, and so this, this DIY street history has often been very appealing to us as a kind of romantic account of trans community formation through resistance. But I actually think that's only half of the story of what went on in that neighborhood during that decade when actually trans people were incorporated for the first time into the welfare state by medically gatekeeping transition. And that this process, this kind of um, class process took place in San Francisco first before it was exported to the rest of the United States and now is sort of being exported internationally. So this is the phenomenon I'm referring to, like I said, just barely tongue in cheek as great society transsexualism. I'll explain to you what that means in a second, but the short of the story I want to share with you tonight is that I think a bargain was struck in this period in the late 1960s in San Francisco, one in which trans medicine was given purpose as welfare reform, casting DIYers as yet another kind of welfare queen. So I'm happy to talk more about this in the Q&A, but I'd argue that it's this bargain which we have long disavowed, that actually structures the political crises we're experiencing right now, not actually a battle between liberal and illiberal or transphobic and pro-trans political movements. Well, that's a lot. I like to promise a lot. <laughs> but let's get into it. Great society transsexualism. What on earth am I talking about? Well, in 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson announced a war on poverty in a State of the Union address to Congress. And its central vehicle was a law passed later that year called the Economic Opportunity Act, which initiated a very profound realignment of how the federal state works. The law provision for block grants from the federal government to directly flow into neighborhood organizations that could fight poverty, bypassing Democratic Party machines at the state and municipal level. And these grants were also meant to check the political power of black activists whose blistering critiques of urban renewals, bulldozers and evictions all across Northern cities were complementing Southern civil rights mobilization. Now this war on poverty was an integral thread in what often is called Johnson's great society liberalism. But the Economic Opportunity Act actually defined that liberalism as an exercise in welfare reform. This law was designed to bring about an overall reduction in the number of people receiving cash benefits, which had grown incredibly unpopular since they were first introduced during the New Deal. But by the 60s, sociologists had generated this new opportunity theory that the war on poverty took up, rejecting economic redistribution in favor of, you're never gonna guess, creating opportunities for people to work their way out of poverty. 
All right, this is all just like standard stuff today, but this is the moment of its birth. So the Economic Opportunity Act had this kind of incredible slogan that was actually in the law, which is that it required maximum feasible participation of poor people in all of its programs. And at the time, it sort of ran with this as a great exercise in American democracy, get poor people involved in changing their lives. But what they really meant was to compel poor people to assume unskilled, low-wage service work, which would not be enough to lift them out of poverty. So in San Francisco, the city assembled an Economic Opportunity Council, which would administer these federal grants and also select specific neighborhoods that would be anti-poverty target areas. And you know, the census data they had on hand found that Central City, uh, which is one of the neighborhoods on the screen here, was probably the poorest in the whole city. It had probably the highest unemployment rate, definitely the worst quality housing, for about 47,000 people. However, this new council ignored Central City and it designated four target neighborhoods based explicitly on racial and ethnic lines. Uh, the black neighborhoods of Hunters Point and Western Edition, Chinatown, and the largely Chicano Mission District. Central City, unlike those neighborhoods, was almost all white. And so it didn't really register in the racialized political framing of the so-called urban crisis of the 1960s. And there's a much longer story I'm abbreviating here, but despite being excluded, Central City was kind of ready to organize in response because it had already been home to over a decade of gay or what they called homophile organizing, beginning with the Mattachine Society in the early 1950s, and also had a whole bunch of really left-wing Protestant churches. Yes, those have existed, <laughs> um, that were willing to ally with gay people actually. So after being excluded, at least a half dozen neighborhood advocacy organizations suddenly appeared from 1964 to 1966, and they kind of created this loose coalition to fight for a fifth anti-poverty target neighborhood that would be located in Central City. And these groups issued a series of pretty interesting reports in 1966 that created a whole new theory of white poverty one that sort of analogized homosexuality and transsexuality to race. So these groups, unironically, I will add, called Central City a white ghetto, suggesting that its white residents were victims of the race-conscious approach to the war on poverty. One of these reports defined the white ghetto as a subculture of 12 to 25-year-olds, quote, who are unloved, and unwanted because they don't fit into society's general idea of productive citizenship. And here they're talking about gay youth and trans youth. These authors cast the Tenderloin's youth as needing services that would basically parent them out of doing sex work, out of doing drugs, and out of their psychological problems. So sexual identification, they underlined in this report, is a major problem. The Central City Ghetto Report concurred describing, quote, growing numbers of troubled adolescents and young adults who have immigrated to the Tenderloin, where they are caught in the midst of conflicting feelings and ideas about their own sexual and personal identity. Remember, that's 1966, so that's pretty intense language for them. Of course, these youth had kind of created a new group identity in the gay life in the Tenderloin, and that sort of filled the gap for having been rejected by their families but the real sin, according to all of these reports, was that it made them unemployable. Yeah. So addressing their social exclusion, their rejection by their families, and the poverty that that rejection caused, according to these groups, required welfare reform, bringing these queer and trans youth into the workforce, which would give them the opportunity to solve their psychological problems by, you know, basically becoming economically self-sufficient and maturing. Now, in its report, the Mattachine Society, the gay organization, stressed that among all the problems in the Tenderloin neighborhood, quote, none of them outranks in seriousness the confusion and identity and purpose of the sexuality of its young adults. The Mattachines described this neighborhood in really outrageous terms as a, quote, human ash heap. And they argued these are gay people talking about other gay people, right? They argued 
um, that white, gay, and trans exclusion from middle-class society, quote, deforms the lives of hundreds of people to the point that any normal sexual growth, development, and concomitant achievement in sexual and social values is unattainable. And so Mattachine then pitched itself to the city as uniquely prepared to fix these problems through delivering rehabilitative social services, working with psychiatrists, doctors, therapists, and ministers. And if they did that, it would, this report stressed, quote, free those hung up on their sexuality to help themselves in other ways by getting a job. So just to say here, when all of these reports use the word sexuality, they understand that word to include the neighborhood's transvestites and transsexuals, some of whom actually had been attending Mattachine meetings since the early 1950s. But what I want to draw our attention to is the way they conceived of the neighborhood's poverty through an analogy to racism. So this white ghetto thesis argued that homophobia and transphobia caused a real lack of opportunity that impoverished white youth making them sort of like black, brown, and Asian youth, but also made them victims of the war on poverty's really soft anti-racism. This is actually a really early and liberal, liberal argument for reverse racism, coming from gay people, right? White gay people. So the Mattachine Society's decade-long endeavor at that point to sort of change the disease model of sexual deviance kind of linked up with the war on poverty's sociology of opportunity, and they really struck gold. One of the ways they finally got what they wanted was, this is no joke, they, the organizers from Central City ascended the marble steps, San Francisco City Hall, leading up to the Board of Supervisors meeting room, um, where the Office of Economic Opportunity representatives met, singing, we shall overcome on purpose, to antagonize the black president of the Economic Opportunity Council. Well, in the midst or in the aftermath of that protest, they finally got what they wanted. Central City was declared San Francisco's fifth anti-poverty target neighborhood. Okay, that's fine, I don't need that. But their timing actually turned out to be terrible. Um, the federal government in 1966 made massive cuts to the war on poverty because the war in Vietnam was costing so much more. And at the time, a report from a service organization in the central city that worked with the elderly remarked that in this new scarce environment, central city's anti-poverty programs seem to mostly focus on, quote, the alcoholic, the narcotic, and the transvestite, for shame. So it's actually quite interesting, though, that the war on poverty in San Francisco officially incorporated gay people and trans people. That, as far as I can tell, didn't really happen outside of San Francisco. And it reflected the unusual success of these homophile activists kind of burrowing into the state as kind of mid 20th century homo nationalists. So Calvin Colt uh, was the first director of Central City's anti-poverty area. He hired Don Lucas, a prominent Mattachine as his right-hand man. And then in 1967, Lucas replaced Colt and ran the whole target area. So it was run by a gay man. Under Lucas's leadership, most of the work they did involved the Central City Multi-Service Center, which was sort of a one-stop shop for social services, all contained in one building, also a place with um, that concentrated job and volunteer opportunities. And so this, this center was organized into five units uh, you know, sort of an omnibus intake and referral system to local, state, and federal social services. It had a drop-in center for youth where they could hang out uh, and spend the night. The largest unit in the building, you'll never guess, was administration. Okay, really interesting. Uh, closely followed by jobs training. And finally, and this is what I want to talk about, the center had an office of the San Francisco Police Department's Police Community Relations Unit, which was staffed by an officer named Elliot Blackstone. And you know, given how much anti-police uh, organizing is kind of mythologized, not just Stonewall, but the Compton's cafeteria riot, it's really significant to me to point out that the police, the police were the anchor of this so-called great society transsexualism. The transsexual and the police. 
Blackstone's office, I think, really became the hub for the transsexual front in the war on poverty. But that was just because that was sort of the purpose of the office to begin with. This community relations approach to policing was an offshoot of a liberal professionalization push sweeping the nation in the 1960s. Actually, the School of Criminology at the University of California, Berkeley, was one of the first to promote community policing as a way to cultivate soft power and really just try and check urban rebellion and get in front of it and deflate it. And as it developed in San Francisco, community relations mostly involved neighborhood advisory committees and public meetings where officers and residents could kind of face off verbally instead of fighting in the streets. But when the Office of Economic Opportunity created those anti-poverty target neighborhoods, it decided to formalize this function and assigned each of the neighborhoods an officer. So Blackstone shows up at the Central City Multi-Service Center thinking he's mostly gonna work with juvenile delinquents. That was the terminology at the time. And he understand that that would probably include a lot of gay kids. But then in November, 1966, someone walked into his office looking for help. From her appearance, quote, as being a male in female clothing, he wrote a little bit later, I thought I was dealing with a transvestite, but she corrected him. No, 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 she was a transsexual. Uh, introducing herself as Louise Ergestras, she explained that unlike a transvestite who just sort of dressed in female clothing, she actually wanted to transition with hormones and surgery, something that she needed and other people like her needed Blackstone's help to do. She then handed him a copy of endocrinologist Harry Benjamin's book, The Transsexual Phenomenon, which had just been published that year, and urged him to read it. Now, while he was working his way through Benjamin's book, Blackstone decided to pay a visit to a doctor at a, city, at a city run clinic in the neighborhood called the Center for Special Problems. Yes, that's really what it was called. The San Francisco Department of Public Health had hired this guy Fort in 1965 to pilot new approaches to the special problems of sex work, drug abuse, uh, incarceration, and homosexuality. Very, very special indeed. But when Fort and Blackstone realized that this Benjamin guy whose book they were reading actually spent his summers practicing in San Francisco, they immediately reached out to some of the local doctors and psychiatrists with whom he worked. And then they also called Benjamin's main office in New York City to verify Louise Ergastras's story. They were very impressed by Benjamin's authority, because he was a doctor, and his confirmation that the Tenderloin was actually home to a lot of transsexual women. And so Blackstone and Fort decided to coordinate their efforts to serve them. Fort added transsexuals to the center's list of special problems, making referrals to psychiatrists and only with their psychiatric approval, allowing his internists to administer hormone therapy in their outpatient clinic. And then Blackstone both referred people over to Fort who wanted to transition, but also devoted his time to the war on poverty's mission of economic rehabilitation. So Ergastras starts introducing Blackstone to some of the neighborhood's transsexuals. And it turns out, unsurprisingly, jobs and poverty are their number one issue. The girls who worked the streets largely did so because it was the only work that they could hold down, period. The gender division of labor obviously relied on passing. If you wanted to work as a woman, you had to convincingly pass as a woman, not just visually, but also bureaucratically. You need social security card, driver's license, and so on. So even for transsexual women who managed to get a job in the formal economy, the criminalization of female impersonation kept the police on their backs. You know, a beat cop stopping a trans woman on her walk to work didn't really care if she was on her way to an office or on her way to the stroll. And repeated arrests and stints in jail led to losing one's job, to eviction from apartments, and so Blackstone came to believe that if he could just convince the San Francisco Police Department to relent on the well-behaved middle-class, or at least aspirationally middle-class transsexuals, they might be able to stay off the streets and find formal employment. But it wasn't really chance that brought this Ergastras person into Blackstone's office. In 1967, she and a few other trans women at the Center for Special Problems 
decided to form a support group. They called themselves COG, which was short for conversion, our goal. Um, and just to say, conversion here means gender affirming surgery, not conversion therapy, I guess. But their meetings blended self-help with a kind of welfare, welfare reform style political consciousness. I think actually what they did was help create a class consciousness for transsexuality by opposing what they wanted to the DIY transitioners on the street and trying to find a way to create a division between them. So for instance, in 1968, three members of COG went on a public radio show with Elliot Blackstone. Now they only identify themselves by their first names on the air. So we've got Sylvia, Judy, and Mandy. Now the host of the show, Herb Cutchins, worked at the San Francisco Bail Project. So he was really interested in Clog's efforts at police and jail reform. So Judy shares that she actually first heard of Clog when she was in jail. She'd been thrown into the Queens tank where they segregated uh, effeminate gay men and trans women. And some of the other girls in lockup told her when she gets out, she should go down to the Center for Special Problems and check out this newly formed support group. Mandy chimes in and says she actually joined COG through Elliot Blackstone, who she had gone to see when she wanted to transition but didn't want to lose her job. And much of the radio hour focused on California's 650 and a half statute, which criminalized female impersonation with an intent to deceive or defraud. The way this law was applied in the tenderloin made life a living hell for trans women. Judy explained on the show that in the summer of 1964, she had been arrested 20 different times under this law, but she was never indicted because every time she appeared in front of a judge, he tossed out the arrest because she had no intent to deceive or defraud. But because she didn't make enough money to make bail, every time she was arrested and thrown in jail, she lost her job. And so she spent the summer chasing one low pay job after another from cocktail waitress to theater cashier. So COG is on the radio talking about police harassment, but they frame it in very liberal terms. Judy explains that she has to break the law, quote, because it's the only way I can obtain an honest living. And so therefore she was being wrongly criminalized out of the formal labor market, depriving her of the opportunity to be self-reliant. Several of the other girls describe really brutal experiences in jail, including strip searches in front of leering men, being placed in solitary confinement for refusing to cut their hair. They're trying to break you down mentally, Mandy emphasized. But Cog only asked for professionalization and reform to protect respectable transsexuals like themselves who did not deserve to be arrested unlike the rest of the girls on the street. Judy explained that the police, quote, treat us as common criminals because they don't even know the word transsexual. And thus they mistake them for, quote, common homosexuals or sex deviants, you know, the ones who should be arrested, apparently. This is not a crime, she emphasized. It is a mental status, a mental problem. If we can educate the public to the idea that we are not harmful to society, Judy went on, then the people might agree that, quote, we should be allowed to live our lives as we must live them. So in other words, medical transition, relief from impersonation laws, and rehabilitation into women's work kind of all unified. Mandy implored any transsexuals listening to the radio to come on down to a COG meeting. We're trying to help ourselves and help others at the same time, she explained. Now, from what I can tell, Blackstone worked with around 40 transsexuals in the last few years of the 1960s, using his office to create a whole series of sympathetic contact, contacts within the growing layers of the welfare state. The local Department of Social Services worked with him on a test case for obtaining a trans woman access to welfare payments, which was rationalized as a way to get her out of sex work as a step to getting a real, jo a real job. But many of Blackstone's successes were really tangible on just the smallest of scales. So in one case, a trans woman who worked at a grocery store actually had to transition on the job because otherwise her psychiatrist would not approve her for hormones and, and surgery. So Blackstone got on the phone, called the store manager, 
then called her union to arrange it and explained that, you know, the women's clothing she had to start wearing were prescribed by the psychiatrist. It's kind of a smart way of putting it. Don Lucas, who I mentioned earlier, often counseled tenderloin youth at the multi-service center. Well, at one point he went with a trans woman named Jackie down to Macy's to help her pick out and pay for a new wardrobe and even served as a reference when she succeeded in arranging breast augmentation surgery at the University of California. But Blackstone really wanted to open the multi-service center's job training programs under federal law to transsexuals. Now his unit came with the budget for two aides. So he hired trans women, like for example, someone named Sandy Thompson to do office work for him. He also discreetly arranged access to continuing education. So a few transsexual women like Thompson attended John Adams Adult High School, got their diplomas, and trained for an exciting career as typists. A 1968 internal newsletter from the center reports that Terry Peoples is also seeking secretarial training, while Mandy Taylor would like clerk typist training following in Sandy's footsteps. Just to say all this jobs training in the war on poverty, like the broader labor market, was intensely segregated by gender and women's jobs paid on purpose substantially less than men's jobs. So as a typist, which I don't think she ever got that job, but if she had, Sandy might have earned 80 to $90 a week at most, which is a lot less than a man would have been making. So this brings me to my last, last section, trans medicine as welfare reform. In 1968, a plastic surgeon at Stanford University which is just across the bay, of course, in Palo Alto, named Donald Laub, met a trans woman named Ella, who was hoping he would perform gender-affirming surgery. Now, Laub had never performed gender-affirming surgery before, but he was kind of interested in the challenge. So what do you do? He gave Harry Benjamin a phone call before saying yes. He also studied up on the procedure, don't worry. <laughs> um, but Benjamin offered to direct more of his San Francisco patients to Laub. And within two weeks, actually, two more trans women showed up at Stanford. And word quickly spread across the bay in the Tenderloin. The Center for Special Problems never established a formal relationship with Stanford, but their proximity in the Bay Area really shaped one another. Joel Fort essentially saw his unit as preparing patients for Stanford putting them through psychiatric gatekeeping for hormones, and then with Blackstone's help, preparing their social and economic rehabilitation so that if they went to Stanford, they would show up as real model compliant patients. And the Center for Special Problems also adopted the gatekeeping tactics that Harry Benjamin and Donald Laub promoted, like requiring a real life test of living and working in the neighborhood as a woman for one year or sometimes two years first to prove that they deserve medical transition. And since the cost of surgery at a private hospital like Stanford was probably between three and $6,000, which is more than most people made in one year in Central City, getting the Tenderloin's transsexuals jobs was a practical matter. Although again, I'll point out the war on poverty's low wage service jobs for women paid a lot less than doing sex work. So it actually slowed them down to go through this pipeline. But these delays were signs of success to these medical architects. When Stanford formalized its gender clinic later in 1968, joining Johns Hopkins in providing the template for the trans medical model we still use to this day, they had one single word to describe the purpose of their clinic. Well, you'll never guess, except I highlighted it. Rehabilitation! <laughs> Working with the psychiatrist named Norman Fisk, Laub and his staff medicalized the welfare reform principles of the war on poverty by demanding that transsexuals enroll in extensive psychological and social programs during their real life test. They hire models to instruct trans women in proper feminine appearance. Actually, they also once hired Truman Capote, the novelist and writer, to teach trans women how to be women. Weird story. I could talk about it in the Q&A. They also stringently investigated 
trans people's heterosexuality and commitment to conventional marriage after surgery, and any failure to rehabilitate meant further delay in approval for surgery. Fisk even had a term for this. It was called putting a patient on hold until they reformed themselves. So in 1972, Lab crunches the numbers. They'd had about 500 people try to enroll at Stanford for gender affirming surgery. And out of 500, 25 had been judged rehabilitated and approved. But guess what? Thanks to that, Fisk was able to say in his first five-year follow-up study of patients who had had surgery, they had a 100% success rate because they had rejected over 90% of people who applied. This bargain, this bargain between the welfare state and medicine was given the teeth we still have to deal with today in 1979 when all of this was codified as the very first standards of care by what is today called the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, an organization in which Stanford played a major role. That guy was one of its first presidents. So this is just a snippet from the process through which trans uh, medical transition was incorporated into the war on poverty, declaring the market and civic value of transition as an exercise in welfare reform. And as you can sort of imagine, these developments really cemented a class difference between upwardly mobile, mostly white transsexuals, though we're talking about like 25 people here, who are forced to prove their rehabilitation and the many, many, many more hundreds of street-based trans women in the tenderloin who are increasingly cast as their foil. The incorrigibles, undeserving of support, who had no recourse but to transition DIY. And I'll just give you one example of the sea change that we can detect about 10 years after all of this happens. In 1978, the California Court of Appeals upheld a superior court decision that ordered Medi-Cal, the state's Medicaid program, to pay for gender affirming surgery for two trans women who were on welfare. Actually, the Los Angeles Times endorsed this court decision in a very flowery column. It also printed a letter to the editor from Joanna Clark, who was a trans woman very active in legal organizing and civil rights. She celebrated this decision, but she also made it very clear that she saw these surgeries as the key to getting these two women off of welfare and into jobs. Yes, she actually complains in her column how, quote, numerous transsexuals have been reduced to the status of non-productive citizens simply because they cannot pass a pre-employment physical. And she really rails against two state senators who had reacted to this court decision by introducing legislation to prohibit Medi-Cal from paying for trans surgeries in the future. Sound familiar, right? Here's what she had to say about that. Quote, these surgeries will cost the taxpayer about $12,000. But what will it cost the taxpayer to maintain these individuals on welfare for five, six, seven, or eight years? Certainly a great deal more. If Senators Campbell and Carpenter sincerely want to do something useful with their elected positions, they might consider introducing an amendment to the present employment laws that would prohibit discrimination on the base of one's sexual status. In this manner, many of the transsexuals currently on welfare might have an opportunity to find employment and as such, not have to rely on Medi-Cal to resolve their valid medical problem. That's leading trans civil rights activist, Joanna Clark. Okay, so what little has changed for girls on the street since this time period, I think is actually the extension of the principles of the war on poverty, which today is LGBT liberalism, shut out from the narrow path to medical transition through the welfare state, being paid really low wages for your experience of trauma, poverty, and state violence is now the only way out of underground economies of hustling. The advent of HIV AIDS social service work in the 1980s and 1990s, and now in the past decade and a half, social service work for Black, Brown, and Indigenous trans organizations and LGBT organizations has offered just a tiny few of these trans women the narrowest route possible off the street 
And I will say only in exchange for them agreeing to work in constantly re-traumatizing environments for way less money than they were making before. And don't take it from me if you want a really moving reflection on the, the true ambivalence of having to live through these historical changes, I highly recommend Kristen Lavelle's fantastic documentary, The Stroll. But let me end sort of where I started and say one more little thing, which is that this zealous mission to restrict transition's value to welfare reform and to demonize DIY transition is frankly responsible for the privatized, baroque, and largely inaccessible system of so-called gender-affirming care that we are told we must now mobilize to save from the terrible right-wing people who would ban it. I don't want them to ban it, but in so idealizing it to save it, we're also being asked to grant it a legitimacy it has never enjoyed certifying the value of transition only to the extent that it is economically productive, minimally expensive to the state and civil society, and does not exercise the expertise trans people have acquired through DIY. So I think until we treat this liberal project of trans inclusion in the welfare state as the primary cause of the unending crisis of poverty and criminalization affecting so many, but not all trans people's lives, rather than idealizing liberal inclusion as the antidote to those problems, I fear that an effective counter politics to the anti-trans movements growing in power today will remain out of our grasp. Thank you all so much for listening. It is my brand to just like hurl so much information at you over 40 minutes. So take a second, digest, you know. So a really big talking point right now politically is the worry if uh, gender affirming care in, in youth is like a good idea medically because it, it can often be permanent. So we have these tests in place to make sure that we're not doing anything that would be for someone who doesn't really need that treatment. And earlier you said um, something about uh, Dr. David Lobb, uh -huh. um, that he needed to prove um, that they deserve yeah. treatment, not necessarily that they like need treatment. And yeah. I'm curious, was he using that language oh. or was, are, are you arguing that kind of his fear of performing treatment on someone that doesn't need it um, as masked as something like that, if, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Love that question. Um, sets up one of my favorite hobby horses. Yeah. You know, big problem we're all dealing with right now is, you know, trans medicine makes daily headlines, especially trans youth transition, right? I think the figure in the New York Times over an eight month period from 2022 to 2023 15,000 words of front page coverage of this very complex, very difficult issue, right? No one had ever heard of puberty blockers or like most people didn't know about this stuff until just now, right? So we're, we're dealing with this real difficult vacuum of, of public knowledge. And I think most people understandably assume that when they hear, oh, there are all these safeguards in place, there's all this gatekeeping, so many roadblocks and barriers that they actually do something legitimate, right? That when a child or an adult is sent to meet with a psychologist or psychiatrist, that clinician can administer some psychological tests to determine or diagnosis and figure out, oh, are you really trans or not? And that's where it gets spicy because there is no objective diagnosis for what makes someone trans. There has never been one, right? Um, and that's fine. I don't think you could create one. Like I dare someone to prove me wrong, but it goes all the way back to Harry Benjamin in the 1950s is the first person to come up with a diagnosis. That's where we get this term transsexuality, transsexualism, transsexual, right? And it's a big issue. 
Benjamin is really upset because there's no biological difference between trans people and the rest of the population, right? That's what he really hoped, that there would be a gene or an endocrine difference, right? Or something kind of intersex adjacent that would explain what made someone trans. But unfortunately, scientists had to concur, and so did doctors, that trans people who came to them were indistinguishable from the rest of the population, so they could not create a diagnosis to differentiate them. There's no way to prove someone is trans unless you take at face value when they tell you, I am trans, right? And they don't want to do that. So instead, the diagnostic regime, which Laub then helps develop and concretize, replaces objective differential diagnosis with prove to me that I'm not going to regret working with you, right? Regret is actually really important to diagnosis in the medical field. It's not the regret we hear about, though. It's what Benjamin, in fact, in the 1950s was came up with this idea of using psychiatrists basically as shields between him and his patients. Because basically what he could do is put a lot of pressure on trans people and whoever was willing to endure all of that pressure, all the invasive questions, all the delays is probably the person who's the least likely to sue him on the other end if he doesn't do a very good job as a doctor or if the surgeon isn't very high quality. So actually this whole gatekeeping regime is designed to protect the legal liability of doctors, right? That's not really surprising in the United States, but it's actually not designed to prevent the future regret of trans people who accidentally transition, right? So ultimately that changes, I think, how we arrive at this conversation about youth, right? It's tempting to imagine there's something riskier with trans youth than there is with adults, but there's actually no way we can administer a magic test that says, yeah, trans or no trans, because obviously transness is not one thing. Um, and so what we've really done is just said it's better to stop tons of people from transitioning so that they don't sue doctors than to just let people make decisions about their own bodies. And so, yeah, ultimately to me, that's really the kind of bait and switch um, that unfortunately most people would have no way to know that that's actually the case. They sincerely believe because all these psychiatrists and doctors come on TV and testify and are part of WPATH as if they're really doing something super objective. But, um, you know, I say this with uh, uh, much love for them. They're, they're just, they're not. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that. Class. Oh, thank you so much, Jules. Um, so I have two questions. One is a quick one. I'm curious what role the Compton cafeteria riots play in your story, because mm. you mentioned it, but then you don't talk about that in relation to like Blackstone. So, yeah. and then my next question, I know you and I have talked about this a lot, but um, the kind of fixation that we see on the right with this idea of detransitioning, right? Yeah. This idea that if one person regrets their decision, then, you know, that's enough to shut everything down. But I'm curious, like how, you know, what you've seen in terms of how does that relate to the kind of earlier fears of like being unemployable, totally. right? So I'm just curious, like what role that plays mm. and then like what role like these new parent advocacy groups for trans kids play in terms of like pushing early transition as a way of, you know, being productive and employable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing questions. I'll answer them in reverse order. Um yeah, I mean, the fixation on detransition, just quantitatively, right, if we take this history to be at least persuasive enough, makes no sense, because most people who want to transition don't get to do it. So how could we possibly be worried about a problem of detransition, right? I also think the concept of detransition is just very silly. It's very obvious that most people who detransition do it because their lives are so difficult, and often they're rejected by family, can't maintain their jobs, get kicked out of school, get arrested, lose all their money, right, get abandoned. That's why people detransition, right? Uh, detransitioners are, you know, uh, people who deserve lots of compassion and, and care and resources, um, yeah, rather than being some sort of gotcha, right? But I love the way you draw that connection, Kristen, because that's exactly it. The real fear around detransition, if we think about it in light of this history, isn't that, oh no, someone who wasn't trans did something, right? And now they'll be upset forever. The real issue is, they're going to become a public charge. They're going to be unemployable. Yeah, because, you know, if you transition a little bit and then detransition, yeah, you might actually have a harder time visually holding down a job in the economy still to this day, right? Or I think Joanna Clark's real fear, right, is that you'll end up on welfare, you know, right? But like that makes sense in this context, right? If the value of transition is to force people to align with the dominant 
family form and political economy that exists, then detransition is just as bad as any other kinds of unaccomplished transitions, DIY transitions, right? People who don't even care about surgery, people who just want a little bit of hormones, but not more of that, right? People who don't care about passing, people who are trans and gay, right? All of these kinds of people are not fitting into that productive model, whether that's a choice they're making consciously or not, doesn't really matter, right? So I agree. I think the real issue in that context is detransition is not, it risks being unproductive <laughs> And sort of falling back into this welfare queen kind of model using healthcare. I mean, Americans, American political culture is all about um, inappropriate use of healthcare, right? Like that's like our number one issue around cost control and why we can't have Medicare for all and why we have to have terrible managed care healthcare plans. Anyways, um, so I agree that within that context, part of the way that transition for young people has signified, whether intentionally or not, for clinicians is, yeah. You know, if you transition young, you're probably going to be super passable. You can probably live a pretty normal life. And I actually think that that's true. I actually think one of the reasons why we're seeing so much anti-trans political violence right now is because younger generations, I mean, even myself, right? I'm part of one of this first generation of trans women to have other jobs than sex work, genuinely. And also to go to college, huge, huge, huge part of it, right? And that little expansion of different paths in life for trans people is a, it, you would think it's like works perfectly with this mid-centrally liberalism and it does, yeah. But obviously there are a lot of people who have a, an objection to it, but I sort of have a left-wing objection to that, right? Um, and then in terms of the role of the Compton's cafeteria, right? Yeah, you know, this is like a much longer book chapter. Part of what I'm really interested in is um, Compton's is so fascinating. It's now like the other Stonewall, right? The, the West Coast Stonewall. We would never have known about it if Susan Stryker didn't like bust her ass in the 90s doing all this archival research and doing a bunch of oral histories and making a documentary film, Screaming Queens, which 1000%, please go watch that after you watch The Stroll. If she hadn't done that work, the memory of Compton's would have disappeared because that riot, it's a really big deal in LGBT history now zero newspapers covered the riot. And I've gone back and looked all of these war on poverty organizations, the central city target area that worked with and delivered services to the girls who rioted, they don't even make a mention of it in any of their documents. And I actually think that's because the riot wasn't this profound moment of resistance that interrupted the regular flow of life. It was just part of this class struggle between the poor girls who hung out at Compton's and were harassed by the cops and the nearby kind of welfare state version of transsexuality. It was business as usual. And I think that's like a story. I think Susan also makes that claim too, but it's just something I'm really trying to, to emphasize and underline to help think about why we have to rush to sort of paper over the real circumstances of Compton's to kind of have this sort of pro progressive glory moment where um, transgender women were you know, leading the way for the gay men who hated them in the Tenderloin, right? Like, you know, just anyways, it's about having more complicated stories. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, back in the 1980s to about 1990, Cook County Hospital in Chicago gave free sex change operations for those that were in need. And, uh, they followed the flagship, which was Johns Hopkins yeah. University under John Money. But one thing they noticed, the majority of trans women that were getting the surgery were turning out to be lesbians. Yeah. That they were from a straight background. Now, we laughed about conversion and we said, oh, cog, conversion. Well, John no, uh, Dr. Paul McHugh, mm -hmm. when he took over at Johns Hopkins, he stopped the sex change operations there in Cook County and all across the United States stopped the free or the uh, federal yeah. monies to provide for it. Yeah. And you wonder what else was going on. They were wanting to cure homosexuality. Remember, homosexuality was still a mental disorder. And if you can turn a, a gay man into a straight woman, 
it was converting them to something that was agreeable to society. But if you turned a straight guy into a, a lesbian, right. you were creating mental illness. Yeah. So there was that underlying religious connection with the Catholic Church yeah. that uh, is often overlooked. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's true. Paul McHugh is this very conservative psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins who was principal in helping shut down that clinic in 1979, right? This kind of conservative Catholic, a Catholic approach to psychiatry. And it's true. One of the things that started to change in the 70s as a lot more private surgeons offered surgery and also some public hospitals and Medicaid provided um, free surgery is that different kinds of trans people were finally getting surgery, right? And one of those groups were gay and lesbian trans people, right? Um, and so it's definitely part of the sort of moral pushback um, on the kind of closure of the clinic, I think is such a great example too. I always like to bring this up. They shut down the Hopkins Clinic in 1979 because of a study that claimed that people who had received surgery um, actually were no, no better off than the people who hadn't achieved sur or who hadn't been given surgery. And it was seen as this damning report. They shut down Hopkins. It had ripple effects throughout the world, devastating effects in Baltimore, which did not reopen a clinic until 2017. Um, but the study, when you go back and read it, is an amazing reason why when people are like, we need more data. We need to make data-driven decisions about trans health care. The line, right? Because this study, here's how the, the two people figured out. They took the sample of trans people who had been given surgery and the sample of people who had been rejected. And they, you know, they didn't find any regret from the people who had been granted surgery and the people who hadn't kept trying to get surgery elsewhere, which meant that they probably should have been approved for it. Okay, so where are we getting to the part where surgery is bad? Well, what they decided was that the people who had been granted surgery. Um, were not well adjusted according to the objective criteria that they determined, which were being heterosexual and married, getting an appropriate job after surgery, and never once again ever having an encounter with law enforcement ever again. And it turns out giving people surgery does not actually increase their economic earning power. Not all of them wanted to get married, and many of them, many of them were still routinely harassed and arrested by the police. So they determined that the people granted surgery you know, basically had not been rehabilitated, right? Well, that's bullshit, right? Those are not objective criteria, period, right? And these weren't rogue scientists. These are very well accredited people who work at Johns Hopkins, which is now where I work. Um, but, you know, it's a great lesson, right? We are repeating a lot of the stuff that has already happened decades ago, but we're often doing it with no knowledge that it's happened before, right? Not like it's no one's fault. Like that's why I got to bust my ass as a historian writing all these books because, you know, and also why we have to listen to people who've been around uh, because they know they know what really happened in the past. So yeah, fabulous question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, is, is it on? I can't tell. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for your work in general. Um, yeah. So I want to ask about the like kind of counter politic that you're, mm. the positive counter politic that you're gesturing at. Mm. Um, and in doing so, I'm kind of stepping a little outside the scope of your that you've set yourself. So maybe, you know, I don't know if it's an unfair question. I'm kind of asking you to be speculative. So if you want to demur, that's fine. No, go for it. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, and so it kind of connects to what you were saying in response to the first person's question yeah. um, about uh, yeah. the sort of, yeah, in general, the sort of medical model of, of transness and transition and Oh uh, yeah, you know, there is no objective criterion by which we can assimilate transness to sort of a like medically normative model of like good human functioning. Yeah. That's that that develops in as you bring out in the talk in response to these sort of like economic liberal pressures, yeah. right? Um fine. And so the question is sort of okay, what's to replace that? Mm -hmm. And in think about that, the question is actually about detransition. So sorry. Um, but um like it makes me think about a common talking point among people who want to sort of rehabilitate or reclaim or accommodate detransition. Um, like Tori Peters frequently it's like says, yeah, says something yeah, like yeah. this all the time, right? Like, well, hey, you know, we don't criminalize like moving to a new city and taking a new job, right? right? Um, and so it seems like, and I, I don't know that this, the reason I'm asking about it is because I don't know that we have like a clear articulation of what this positive alternative looks like, but mm. it 
you, you could, might think it's vaguely gesturing at like a, a way of thinking about transness that's like more like integrated into the idea of a course of a human life is in a more like anarchic way maybe or something like that but I don't know what like I don't know personally what that looks like and I'm wonder if you have thoughts about that or if that's even what you're if you think of yourself as in that vein no totally spot on very thoughtful question um you know I I mean I'm part of what it is for me right is like one I don't understand if I'm just speaking like in 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 generality here from my beliefs from from my reflections of my work not like in a sort of real politics sort of way there's no reason to me that transition has to be medicalized in this form right that's because some of it's like not that hard right the reason why diy hormones are so popular is like you really don't need to go to a doctor to do hormones like it's like it's the same shit that's in all of our bodies you're just changing the levels with bio identical versions right so it's like you need you know, one blood test a year for the first few years. And then honestly, like most, most people are good to go. Nice to have the help of a doctor if you have a doctor, right? But um, obviously surgeries are a little trickier, right? People, we need surgeons, right? Um, so it's, there's a bigger question just about healthcare, right? Um, I will point out that trans people's access to transition is actually generally not better in countries with national healthcare systems. It's often a lot worse. That's because this WPATH model is just horrific. I mean, it's just strangling everyone. Um, But in a lot of those countries, there's only one clinic to go to, one surgeon for millions of people or zero, right? So not clear to me that the solution is just public health care. But if we're just thinking about transition as kind of a cool thing that people can do, right? Like, well, then, yeah, if we de-exceptionalize trans people's transitions, right, it would take a lot to create a world in which it was not remarkable to transition, but it's certainly easy to imagine, right? I've said this before in the context of being a historian of, of the science of sex and gender. I mean, from my reading of the history of science, all sex does is change, right? Do you have the same sex you had when you were born? Uh-uh. When you were seven years old? No. When you went through puberty, it completely changed your sex, right? Human beings are a species with menopause. It's a pretty dramatic sex change, right? Literally, the point of sex is change over time. And in that sense, transition, detransition, those are just little vectors on that overall process, right? A lot of different transsexual animals out in the animal kingdom, very well-documented phenomena, right? A lot, and actually, it's like, I'm not saying this because I'm a fan, but you can go back 1867, Charles Darwin, noting how a lot of animals under the right environmental conditions will change sex, says in a book, I bet humans probably could too. Didn't know how at the time. And obviously we can't just like do it if like the temperature is right, obviously. But like, congratulations, we have technology. We're technical creatures, right? So, you know, I would love to live in that world. What I'll say for the moment though, and maybe a starting place. And this is where I actually, I don't really believe in there's a thing called transness. I'm fine to jettison that. I think it's a sort of ultimately ethnocentric Western imposition on the rest of the world and on ourselves. But but what I will say is this, I think actually people transitioning scares the shit out of a lot of people. And actually it should. And, and here's why. If you're willing, especially to undergo surgery, I say this as someone who had kind of a shitty recovery from some surgery this summer. If you are willing to accept an intense breach of your sovereign self, your body, surrender under anesthesia, to a surgeon, and let's face it, all surgeons are like 10% sociopathic. Um, You have to be able to cut someone open, right? If you're willing to to accept that kind of breach, you are willing to embrace a form of freedom that is about exercising uncertainty. I do not know what will be the outcome of this, but I am willing to undergo a profound transformation of myself, and I do not accept that the body I have today and the one that I was told was assigned this way at birth is my destiny. That's terrifying to most people. Like that's a pretty uncomfortable embrace, right? It is not just socially deviant to be a little perverse with my language. It's genuinely interesting and compelling, right? Not inherently, but in the world we live in. And so that to me is a starting place to think about what is valuable about transition that challenges how human beings live their lives, right? If we can get from there to a world where it's actually no longer remarkable, that would be a real arc of, of collective justice, but nuts and bolts for me, 
it's 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 the same struggle as abortion. We have to get away from abortionist healthcare towards a reproductive justice framework, and that means abortion is something people do, something people need, it's something that should be freely available without any moral kind of qualms. And building a world where that were true, where people, you know, where where you know, black uh, women's mortality rates, where trans masculine people's access to abortion were actually secured and taken care of, is is completely transforming the world we live in. And that's, you know, ultimately to me, the real implication here, yeah. Um, first, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I learned so much and this was great. Um, my question is um, to what extent has anti-sex work stigma oh. paired with transphobia um, impacted the liv lived experiences of trans folks during the time period that you discussed? Yes, what a great question. Thank you. I mean, this is like the other pivotal point, right? Um, people who have like, if you've listened to any of my other recent lectures, not that you should have, but if you have, you know, I kind of like to like beat up on trans. I don't really like that word very much anymore. And one of the reasons why is it just flattens out some pretty serious differences, right? Like I understand why it does, but one of them it flattens is gendered differences, right? Like trans men and trans women or trans masks and trans femmes have profoundly different experiences because we live in an incredibly sexist society, right? It's not because there's something secretly good or bad about trans men or women, right? So trans women's predominant experience of transition is losing legal rights, like, like historically, right? Because actually only men could vote, only men could own property, right? Well, white men, um, you know, and so, Trans men, like at the beginning of the 19th, early 20th century, often would sometimes like actually see their, you know, living standards go up when they transition, if they could pass, if they could kind of go stealth, right? If they could get married, be very conventionally male, right? But that was somewhat possible because American culture had a concept more broadly of female masculinity, right? There's sort of intermediary categories. Well, there are no equivalents of that for trans femininity, right? Um, and so trans women almost always lost everything when they chose to transition. It's still often the case today. But one of the things they really did lose, and these mid-century people weren't wrong, is they lost the ability to work. That's why trans women do sex work. That's the reason why, right, historically speaking. But so anti-sex work stigma is pivotal, pivotal to this history. And honestly, it's only women who have been doing sex work who ever talk about this, right? It's only you know, black and brown trans women in particular who have formed movements around this, who actually organize around this. And the word trans bears all of that away. And one of the reasons that it does is this history. Those transsexuals of the great society variety wanted to get out of sex work. They wanted to disavow sex work. But you can actually go back and look in the time period. Uh, one example, the psychiatrist Robert Stoller, really, really, really pivotal in creating a lot of the medical psychiatric concepts for transition, literally would say, some people are fake transsexuals, right? And he doesn't mean people who would regret it. He means people who transition just so they can be sex workers, people who transition so they can be better strippers, people who transition so they can make more money in the sex industry, which is like kind of not really the way it works if you got surgery. But anyways, um, like literally you have all of these people, including psychiatrists saying the sex working trans women aren't even real. They're fake. They're doing it for a wrong reason, for money. So anti-sex work stigma has been across the board shared by everyone, right? By the gatekeepers, certainly, but also by this liberal trans project and also by the gay and lesbian project, which was also all about respectability politics um, coming out of the 50s and the 60s. So that to me is always the urgent starting place, right? If a movement is not serving sex workers, it's probably just not gonna serve very many people at all. Like that really is, you know, kind of the most useful canary in the coal mine. Um, and so to my mind, you know, that raises so many kinds of questions today. We might think about how anti-trans legislation is enhanced by, reinforced by and follows anti-sex worker legislation, namely SESTA and FOSTA, these two laws passed in the last five years that have dramatically um, changed the way people are able to do sex work under the name of, uh, you know, regulating bad obscenity content on the internet, right? There's a law before Congress right now, If I mean, spending the week calling Congress about, about um, a ceasefire in Palestine, but if you wanna call them about something else on top of that, um, there's a bill right now that's supposed to be about protecting children from obscene speech online. 
very much an anti-sex worker kind of argument that uh, a lot of critics are worried will basically make trans speech online quasi illegal and can be used to prosecute trans people under the guise of seducing children, corrupting children, all of that fun groomer panic stuff that's going on right now. So just to say, right, anti-sex work stigma is almost like the infrastructure to which all of this happens, but it almost never gets talked about or named because that's how powerful the stigma is, right? And so to my mind, it's like, not only do we have to care about it, if we were to listen to and take seriously the agendas that sex workers have politically, we probably find a lot of solutions to the problems we're dealing with right now. Yeah, that's my considered opinion as a historian. <laughs> Jules, we have one more question. Okay, I know I've been really long in my answer, sorry. Thank you so much, Professor Peterson. Um, how I'm trying to, I'm trying to frame my question. Yeah. So one gorgeous, I love you. You should be on my committee. <laughs> That's not a class. Um, I know. I, um, I'm interested in thinking about transition. The trans, the transition of transition is a relation to political economy. I've also thinking about the concept of measure because I've been thinking about how transness gets caught up mm. in measure metrics, identification. And it's so hard to escape that. And I'm, I'm saying this because as a Black trans woman, I was having a conversation at this bar here in High Park. And I was talking to my girlfriends, two Black women about like, sister, sister Black women about like, yeah, I'm thinking about getting my puss, you know, like I want to get surgery, SRS, ha ha ha. And the first thing, like, you know, my girlfriend said, or I, th I thought they were my girlfriends, like, how are you getting that? How are you, who's paying for that? Mm. And I'm like, why does that matter? Mm. And the second thing she says, like, oh, like, our tax dollars are paying for that. But like, like, like as a cis woman, I can't get like free like breast implant. Like she like started like throwing all her kind of troubles about the like about the economic understandings of like Medi-Cal and my ability to transition onto me as if like one, as if everyone in the United States can access SRS or any kind of hormone therapy, which is not true. Like black trans women in the South don't have access to anything, right? Like many women of color, you know. Anyway, all that to say, I'm interested in, like, if during this time in the 1960s, you're also thinking about the concept of measure in relate and all what's happening, like, politically in San Francisco in relation to, like, maybe some movements that are happening with women of color in San Francisco. Mm. In particular, I'm thinking about, like, Black women's relationship to the welfare state and, like, Black women's, you know, theoretically Black women's inability to be seen as women. Like, we can theorize that a little bit more and think about yeah. spillers and all these other Black feminist yeah. um Black feminist theorists, but I'm thinking about like if there's like a part in the book or in this chapter that mm. you'll be talking tangentially about these kind of histories, mm. rebellious histories. Mm. One being kind of like some trans women want and need to kind of like utilize like medical condition to like be a part of the state, mm. to become state actors, to access things they normally wouldn't be able to and disavow sex workers and DIY trans trans folk. And also, you know, at the same time, they are, I'm thinking like maybe the Black trans persons or black women of color's kind of positionality within the welfare state and their inability to kind of like ever access this category, even in the kind of like onset of them wanting to move through medical transition. So I mean, yeah, I guess like I'm interested in like you talk about if you talk about that in the chapter and yeah. what the concept of measure also is doing for you in at a relationship to the economy of transition. Yeah. yeah. A lot. Oh, well, it makes sense. A lot is my favorite amount um, to use that to use a measure uh, uh, figure of speech. Yes, also is my uh, this is like exactly kind of actually where I end up in the longer chapter. You know, I talk about what starts to change in the 1970s in San Francisco. The city of San Francisco is experiencing since 1950 profound white flight, like a lot of other large U.S. cities. Right, while you see these manufacturing jobs disappearing and they're being replaced by um, yeah, like skyscraper downtown kind of jobs at, at firms, corporate firms, right? But the people who take those jobs don't live in San Francisco. They live across the bay and they drive across the two bridges, right? They're commuters. So San Francisco's population, white population is like in free fall. And then also you have the city trying to destroy entire black neighborhoods to gentrify them. But in any case, by the 70s, the city actually is becoming a lot more racially diverse because a lot of uh, there are a lot of new black residents and a lot of new Asian um, and also um, yeah Chicano and you know Latinx residents moving to the city. And part of what happens then is the tenderloin finally starts to be less white. It was actually like weirdly one of the whitest parts of San Francisco, and it doesn't start to change till the early seventies. But because of that, 
that's really when you first start to see a sizable amount of Black trans women moving to the Tenderloin because they hear the same stories as everyone. Oh, San Francisco, that's the place to go if you want to transition. And if you want to make real money in the sex industry, that's probably the best place in America. So one person who I look at who gave a wonderful oral history in the Treader um, Oral History Project at the University of Minnesota, her name's Tracy uh, Jada O'Brien. She moved to San Francisco early 1970s from St. Louis, where she came up in the gas uh, lamp district with other uh, Black trans women. She moves there, and first of all, she goes to the Center for Special Problems to get on hormones, change her driver's license, and then that's it. She never tries to get to Stanford. She never accesses any of these other services that had been created. And despite all these efforts Cog had made with the police, she gets arrested all the time, thrown in the Queen's tank. She stays in the neighborhood well into the 80s, right, before she moves on. And one of the questions I asked is like, okay, so this, this new welfare state metric for the value of transition, but like genuine um, first time, there's a surgeon in the Bay Area who's going to do it. Why did this, this new generation of Black, Brown, and Asian trans women not even try to access it? And it's because they knew that those services, first of all, would turn them away at the door, right, for being unqualified. But I think underneath that, part of what I would say, right, is that the logic of great society transsexualism cuts its teeth on an anti-Black distinction between the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. And that's a much older distinction, not invented in this time period, not invented by these people, but adopted by them, right? And so part of what I think the surgery, which is what they used to call it, really used to signify, right, is a kind of anti-Blackness, but in the sense that these new services for white, queer, and trans people are um, sort of being argued for, against the black drop and against the foil of black women, non-trans black women, as the so-called disproportionate users of the welfare state, even though that's not actually true, right? That's a much broader US history in which I actually think trans history fits very well. And I think that that explains why someone like O'Brien doesn't even bother trying. Um, and neither do some of the other trans women of color in that neighborhood who also, some of them won't even go to the Center for Special Problems they're still running black market hormones up from Mexico in the 70s because they don't want to waste their time with the city. They trust each other much more. They know with one another as each other's doctors, things are much safer. But of course, sadly, <laughs> at least as of yet, we still don't know how to do DIY bottom surgery, right? So yes, I mean, I think, I think part of what we can say is a literal cost was stamped on transition. How much money the surgery cost, who's going to pay for it? And we live with the legacy of that to this day. One other consequence of this is like literally inflation. The cost of surgery is off the charts today. It was only like $5,000 back in the day, right? Like I even adjusted, like you can see from the 60s to the 70s, the huge inflation in the cost of surgery. That prices tons and tons and tons of poor black and brown trans women out of the surgery just at the moment that surgeons were starting to practice it all over the country. So totally with you that metrics and measure are a really helpful way, I think, to kind of not just make sense of this, to like literally dissect it empirically, right, and see the numbers, like, like it's a real show me the money moment, right? Um, so perfect final question. Um, and thank you all, like you just have great endurance as an audience. I appreciate it.